Hey folks, thanks for joining us here at the Punisher War Journal. I just wanted to remind you that this is TVMA and the checkbox has been marked. So, word of warning, if you got the babies in the car, it might not be the time to listen right now. But I'm glad you're here and hopefully you get something out of it and you have some fun with it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Punisher War Journal, a show that I have been waiting for for a long time. My name is Phil Moselak. Some people know me as Mose. And I brought together a group of members, members of all people that love these types of shows and wanted to contribute to it. The Punisher itself may have some stigma attached to it. These guys said, to hell with stigmas. And we want to talk about something that it seems kind of interesting and kind of awesome. I think I think for me, at least, uh, I got to say, I'm pleasantly surprised uh, that the first three episodes are as good as they are. I am joined tonight or today, whenever you're watching, by Devin Higgins. Greetings, longtime listener, first time caller. (laughs) Eric Scott. Hi, insert witty relevant quote here. Nice. That sounds like a Tony Sindelar moment. Uh, Jason Johnson. Hey, folks. And Sean Shibley. My intro was already taken. <laughs> Look, that's just the way it goes sometimes. Sorry. So we're starting out with episode one. We're going to do a big chunk. We're going to cover episode one, two, and three. And I was filling out these note cards and I usually don't use them, but I realize that there are through lines through, you know, these, especially these first three episodes. Um, first of all, guys, uh, I found the first episode um, to be a great groundwork for this character that we got to know very, eh, very well in, in Daredevil season two. And some may say he kind of stole the show. Because, you know, ninjas and all, uh, we, we kind of got outside of, uh, outside of that and got to meet Frank Castle uh, and his relationship with Karen, which was very interesting. And we start to see what happened after that. Gents, what, what did you think of the first episode, the, the high points for you? I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, I will say I'm disappointed that all these notes I took on characters don't mean no good because there's quite a few of them who didn't make it out of the episode. But overall, I thought it was a great intro. Yeah, I, I thought it was pretty good. I like the fact that it only took us one episode before Frank kind of got back into the swing of things, so to speak, that they didn't drag it out for you know two or three episodes. There was one thing that I was curious about going from Daredevil into Punisher was – how consistent was Frank going to be? Because obviously you have a new staff of writers, you have a new team putting Punisher together who weren't the same people that did Daredevil, but the question was going to be, could they transfer what we liked about Frank as the Punisher in Daredevil over to his own series? And I did like the fact that that consistency remained there. Frank maintains his personality, maintains his approach to things, and I think John Bernthal, especially just going from being in Hell's Kitchen to being out on his own, I think, yeah, he did a really good job about it. I liked it because it showed uh, kind of him coming down off of his manic uh, rampage in Daredevil. It seemed like you know he had this outburst, and then he was kind of done. He was just, and I kind of liked that feeling. Well, yeah, you know, speaking on that, like I think a lot of people. I mean see if this is wrong in, in your mind that you know the stigma attached to some of these higher potent quote you know mature you know you have the the deadpools the logans and now the punisher and the punisher kind of came out as this you know you know just engine of death and i always felt like there was more to him than that and i thought that's what daredevil kind of put forward 
but it still was very, very, uh, well, it, it, let's just say it. I mean, it was ultra violent. I mean, this, this, this whole series kind of touches some really sensitive spots for people, wh- whether it be, uh, gun rights or just this, you know, wild bombastic, you know, mass shootings, which I don't think you, I don't think it, it, it touches on like, but it's just that environment that we're in. And I think there were so many people, like it was hard for me to put together a crew because I don't think that, I think there was some sort of, you know, like, Ooh, you watch the Punisher. Ooh. And that, that felt weird to me. Well, and and I'll agree with that because, you know, I came to the Punisher through, um, an introduction through cartoons, right? The old Spider-Man cartoons and, and him crossing over into those. And and to have this character introduced who's a, a much more uh, real character, you know, actually has justifications. And I realize they had that in the comics, but this this just, especially seeing it on the screen, it's a much more um, well-rounded and well, not well-rounded, it's probably not a good word, but, you know, well-thought-out and reasoned character. So, Yeah, something that always... Uh, spoke to me about the character is he has no illusions about what he is. Um, he doesn't consider himself a hero. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have uh, like the Batman and his one rule thing, right? Um, and uh, the quote that always stuck with me uh, was from. Uh, the 2004 movie where he says, this isn't justice, this is punishment. And it just struck me that he, you know, this is someone who knows exactly what they're doing, exactly why it's wrong, but exactly why he feels it's necessary. Well, that was something I was interested in as well. uh, And to Philip's point about how with Daredevil season two, you had that first influx of really, more visceral violence with uh, with what Frank was doing, things that were happening to him. Of course, everybody looks at what happens with that jail scene in the corridor to think, wow, that was really brutal and harsh and things like that. And what I was curious about was to see what was going to happen with Frank on his own and how much they were going to turn that up. Because I've heard some people who say um, that to an extent it wasn't Punisher enough. And they go back to like War Zone and what happened there and all the grizzly way over the top stuff that they put into that version of frank that a lot of people say is the definitive version of frank until this version came along so i like how the the producers and and the story writers managed to try and push the envelope with the violence but didn't make it so gratuitous as to just say well this is the punisher so get ready for wholesale splatter death yeah i didn't see it being blood porn at all i remember Tim Goodman, uh, when Daredevil season one came out, he wasn't interested in it. In fact, he made the quote blood porn. And I, you know, I was like, you know, it was mostly because of the kingpin scene where he's smashing a head in the door. Um, I didn't see it as that. Uh, and in fact, that was in this episode, especially you don't, you get, you get a lot of almost kind of gratuitous, but it's, you know, it's the exacting, uh, to seal up the whole schoonover um, events that had had happened. And so it was Frank closing off and cauterizing all of that that it ha- that it happened. And then it, it's it's Frank from like, I just want to be left alone. I'm done with this. I'm staying dead. I am now Pete Constiglio. and that's that's my life now. And then by the end of episode one, well, hell breaks loose. And by the way, uh, that Tom Waits song couldn't be much more perfect than when, when Frank decides to get involved. And he gets involved. Why? Just because uh, he's kind of got not a friend and he's not looking to make friends, but he you know, is kind of at a point where I could do something correct. And we're talking about quotes of, you know, it's, it, it's not, uh, it's punishment. I found one in episode two that I want to bring up right now, which is, and it's something that Russo says to Madani, which is soldiers can't question legality or morality in the moment, which I found to be, which kind of sums up, you know, how their, their mode of operation. 
I I agree. I also think the violence in this is the exact opposite of gratuitous because gratuitous violence to me means violence that doesn't move the story forward, that doesn't serve a purpose except to glamorize violence. And with the Punisher, you're getting the feeling that this is horrible, that like, you know, it's ugly and messy and visceral and it's not trying to make it look fun or something you want to do. It's showing the horror of these actions. Uh, For me, the really telling moment for the Punisher as a character, I think, happened on Daredevil Season 2. You know that roof scene where they kind of have the conversation going back and forward? Mm -hmm. Um, When he almost shoots the landlord or the super or whatever. Interesting. Like, I felt that he realized right after that that he had to have a line. And I think that was kind of the beginning of the kind of cool down, depressed, beardy Frank we get at the beginning. And how about that beard? Boy, Barenthal <laughs> was a nice beard. That he is only one had six thing, months to grow it. That's one thing that kind of bugged me was how those other construction workers were bullying him. Yeah. Right? Even if they didn't know who he was, he's still John Bernthal, you know, a solid slab of muscle holding a sledgehammer. Yeah, I mean, if you're beating up against the wall 14 hours a day nonstop, I mean, you have to be jacked after that point. I mean. But like how the other construction workers are like bullying him, and pushing him around, I just found that a little. Uh... Yeah, I think. I, you know, you know, I, 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 it, I guess it's one of those narrative plots where if we don't have that, like these guys kind of involved in some crime, which we learn about later, but they're something, you know, they have to create that that ignition point for Frank, um, and they do that by trying to uh, kill this guy that's kind of trying to befriend him, um, and. Let's talk about one other thing that you know, because I was I was looking through my notes here, and we have some some points that seem to follow with us. One is the nightmares, and the other is the support group, and our introduction to inside of that support group, both Curtis, who leads it and knows Frank and knows Frank still alive, and Lewis, who seems to be the veteran, very much a kid. Um, and having been growing, you know, I, I was in North Carolina for about, oh, 10 years, uh, right by Camp Lejeune. I saw these guys, like, a lot. And so it was interesting to, to bring that, um, that those youthful guys that, you know, they came in at 18, they're out at 21, and they're kind of messed up. I mean, there's some things that we don't even know that that have really traumatized these guys. And I really appreciate the show for kind of bringing that to light, even though we all talk about it, we all know about it, but we don't really, you know, feel their weight. So I actually lived in Beirut in the early nineties. So I saw a lot of this, you know, the kind of the after effects of these things firsthand. And, uh, it's really more common to see soldiers that simply don't want to talk about it to anyone else that it weighs on them. You, and, and I think that's where the support group really worked for me as, as part of the show to get the characters, you know, get the feel for that ment- mental state. Uh, the, the nightmares, not so much. I thought they kind of jarred me out. Um, there were too many of them per episode, but mm-hmm. I, I definitely thought that the, uh, the support group part really worked just the, the, the the dreams the nightmares just were, were too much too much too often. Yeah, I had the same kind of opinion because I, I like the support group, seeing how everybody dealt with things in different ways. But then with like the constant jump back to his torturing himself with his flashbacks or his nightmares, I I guess on the first run through, I kind of fast forwarded through a couple of them just because I'm like, okay, it's him and his wife again. Got it. Next, you know. But yeah, going through it again, I can see where they they were building on it, but still, it's a little too much. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Like, as we watch those nightmares unfold, by episode three, uh, Frank takes off his mask and we find out, you know, because he has this this overwhelming guilt that it was because of his actions in Kandahar that 
that's the whole reason his wife is dead. Who we, you know, because Wolf, uh, Wolf happens to be uh, one of the heads at Homeland Security. Um, who we haven't even talked about Madani um, and our feelings on her, but um, that that he he kind of has has now been led to believe that it's his fault. Right, but if I can get back to that for just a second, I mean, the, the interesting thing about the group is, and, and I, coming from my own perspective, as somebody who lives with PTSD, and I will say up front, I am not a soldier. I don't know the first thing about what people in that particular uh, sphere of existence go through, so I'm not going to compare myself one-to-one with it, but as I've understood it in my own uh, recovery from it over the last nine, ten years, one of the things that really creeps into a person's mind when they have PTSD is what they refer to as intrusive memories. And how I saw that dream with Frank was it's an intrusive memory that will not go away. And he looks for distractions and things to get him out of it, which is why he's hammering away at the wall, which is why when you see him most times when he's alone in his apartment, he's reading a book. Mm -hmm. He's looking for some way to escape from it. But as soon as you try and go to sleep, those memories will start playing back in your mind, which is why he will go out there in the middle of the night and not sleep. Um, to that end, the 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 flip side with Lewis, which I thought was really interesting, was as a young guy who is coming back from the war and is trying to basically figure out his place in it, where all these promises have been made. If you go and you make this sacrifice, if you make this noble sacrifice and serve your country, these opportunities are going to be given to you when you get back. And he's finding out the hard way that he's not getting them. And and I can understand very easily the disillusionment that he has. If there's one gripe I have about the the group setting, it's that Curtis's parable of the guy in the hole. Mm -hmm. I think Leo McGarry said it better to Josh Lyman on the West Wing. (laughs) But but that's just me. Um, Yeah, as someone recovering from PTSD myself, the intrusive memories really rung true. Um. And for Frank, violence is his drug, right? That's That's what he knows. Yeah. And uh, kind of in the same way Jessica Jones is always drinking the hot, you know, it's kind of different behavior coming from the same place, right? They, you, you can't stop remembering. And that's why I thought that the, the repeated showing you of the nightmares and everything, it's, to kind of put you in its place. It's it's supposed to be too much because it is too much. That's, that's an inter- a valid point. Yeah, yeah, that's a very interesting like like even in like a uh, a stylistic manner. Like it's it it is to interrupt, you know, oh, I'm in, I'm I'm li- liking the show, but oh no, Frank, okay. Yeah, I that's that's fascinating. Yeah, I just starred that. That's great. That's going in the notes. Yeah, and that was the other thing I liked about Curtis's conversation with Frank after the group. Is that, that was a, a line that stuck out to me where he said, nobody's happy because everyone wants to be somebody else except Frank. Frank seems to be okay with where he's at now, just with his hammer, bashing walls down rather than being the Punisher. Because in his mind at that point, his job is done. And he's trying to move on, and he wants to move on, but those dreams that he's having and the memory he has of his family. And of course they use the picture for a, a obvious reference throughout the whole series. Mm-hmm. It, it's that Michael Corleone line of just when I think I get out, they can find a way to pull me back in. And for him, it's his own mind that's dragging him back in because of everything that had happened to him. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, let's, let's change gears for just a moment. Uh, we are introduced to Madani, and she has her own set of baggage, and it involves our buddy Micro. And we, I think we were all pretty excited at the end of uh, Daredevil Season 2 when Frank gets the CD or DVD uh, from Micro. And we're all saying, like, oh, Microchip, this is, this is it. So now I'm thinking, great, Punisher series. And but Madani also got that information uh, simultaneous and then was shut down. And so she's kind of working behind the scenes. She would like to work on her investigation of Kandahar, but that gets derailed by Wolf. 
how are we feeling about Madani? And we can go. Let's go ahead and bring it out to episode two and episode three, and and how how she kind of starts to play into this. Well, this actually brings me to my biggest gripe about the series. Um, uh, Madani uh, is a good character. I just kind of feel that her plot line turns this into not the Punisher and turns it into the firm, if that makes any sense. Like a pre- like now some people have said this is like this becomes more of a procedural. Is that what you're getting at? Uh yeah. It's um you have this you have these two sides trying to right the same wrong. One kind of inside the system on the fringes and one, you know, outside represented by microchip and uh, castle. By the way, it was really jarring to see him after his role in Girls <laughs> um, on a side. Yeah, I, I thought the same thing. I'm like, hey, that's Dizzy. Right. <laughs> um, I just kind of feel that they leaned a little too heavy on the the system isn't going to fix this because the whole point of the Punisher is the system isn't going to fix this. Maybe so, but it, from the reverse perspective of Madani, and, and I labeled her the Ice Queen, and not only because when she flashed her badge at a, sticking out of that Mustang, it's said in big letters, ice across the top of it. Mm-hmm. But she, um, you know, they're both dealing with survivor's guilt in different ways. Ahmad Zubair, the, the guy who is in the video, she has a personal connection to. They were partners. So she is trying to figure out from her own headspace how to move on and how to get what she needs out of that to feel satisfied that what happened to her, her partner is dealt with in the right way. And whereas Frank is coming at it, obviously, from his own perspective of knowing that the system doesn't work and having lost faith in the system, Madani is coming from the side of the angels of the system has to work. Otherwise, why do we even have it in the first place? So I understood that dichotomy. I think at times it did get a little sidetracked here and there, but I mean, that's going to happen in in any series, no matter how long you let it go. Yeah, um, and I will say that when I saw this was 13 episodes, I kind of always felt the Marvel series that go 13 have always a little bit of drag to them. <clears throat> indeed, indeed. And like when Defenders was 8, I was like, hey, they, they figured it out. But <laughs> but they kind of didn't. I, I'll, I'll say on record the same thing. I had heard that it was only going to be 10 at most. And then when I and then then I had heard oh it's eight and I was like eh, well I wish there was more but I I understand what may happen and then lo and behold you know Friday came and it was thirteen and I was like oh boy this could be this could go really south really 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 badly. Although I will also add for the record I did find it refreshing that for the first time in three series now that there wasn't a single ninja to be found in the greater five boroughs of Brooklyn. you goddamn right. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Um, well, I think they're I, all dead now. So something also really interesting is I feel uh, Karen's sympathy for castle is uh, earned, right? Going all the way back to Daredevil season one, when she shot Wesley, and it was heavily implied that wasn't her first time having to do something like that. I want to thank you so much for bringing that up because I, I, I had it in the back of my head and I totally had forgotten. But, you know, Karen did murder and that's I and there was a gravity to to her doing that. And it it it's where Frank fits in so well with her. It's like, I understand what you did. I've done it a lot. And I'm going to, you know, help you out through this. And it, their their relationship is such an interesting one. And in a, it's, you know, it's almost like you, you kind of want them to kind of get together, but you know that that's just, that's just not a feasible thing. But it's just a, a powerful, powerful friendship. Well, and speaking of Karen, did they say, and I missed it, when this was taking place in regards to the Netflix Marvel timeline? No, and I was curious about that because if this is post-Defenders, 
obviously she's of the understanding that Matt is gone. Yeah. So there was no mention of that. And though I did make sure to going back watching season two of Daredevil, the fact that Frank does not know that Matt is Daredevil, but the understanding of that Karen is connected to Daredevil somehow, that there was no even remote mention of that part of the storyline to connect the three of them. Um, I think that would have, I don't, and really if they tried to fit it in, in hindsight, I don't really know how well that could have worked. So I think just, but having her there as an emotional anchor point for Frank, you had to have that one way because otherwise it was going to try and interject maybe other supporting characters that we've seen throughout the, uh, the other series that may not have worked either. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I think this probably is post defenders just because how established she is at the paper. Mm -hmm. Um, like, you know, fantasy Marvel newspaper, but still, um, so she seems pretty comfortable there. So I'd assume she'd been there a while. And I can't see her not bringing Matt into this if she thought Matt was alive. That, that's a good point. Yeah. And I do have two points on, on Karen's uh, subplot in this is that, one, I did like her conversation in episode two with Ellison about – why the story about micro didn't make it in the paper. Yes. I mean, yes I've, I've right. been, a, I've been a journalist for 10 years and I have dealt with editors who have had to make those sorts of decisions. And if you have a government agency that's banging on your door saying, you're not going to run this. And if, if you have to look at the bigger picture to say, okay, does this mean they're going to try and shut my paper down? Is they're going to make my job harder? Are they going to give me access to do more stories? You have to make those hard choices that Karen doesn't like because obviously she's the idealist and all that. But from Ellison's perspective, he did make the right call. Conversely, having been a journalist for 10 years, there's no way in the world Karen can afford that apartment that she <laughs> did when Frank walks in the door. Yeah. I know. Unless she, unless she somehow got one in like way out in Jersey somewhere where the rent's cheaper. I wish oh. I could make that sort of money. Cause I'd love to work at the bulletin at that case. And speaking of the apartment, yeah. <laughs> and speaking of the apartment, I do want to mention that I really, really liked um, Frank's low tech solution of here's some flowers, put them in the window. You know, don't don't call me, don't try to get a hold of me, just put the flowers in the window. Um, I actually like the newspaper bit because it's yet another way the system's failing. The press is supposed to, you know, be one of the ways we get recourse against, you know, corruption in the government and things like that. And it not working is kind of giving you, you know, the feeling that it it's coming from all sides. Well, and it's not so much that it isn't working, but there's a there is a fine line between where you can go and if you step over that, the consequences of stepping over it. So, I mean, because we had seen in in other uh, seasons of Daredevil where like Ben had gone after government agencies and they had called out the, and and done their job, but. When you start getting into those murkier waters, it becomes that question of, okay, sink or swim. You're right. Ben got his head crushed for going one step too far. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting how they put, put Karen in the Ben Urich position. And I'm, I'm going to go speak a little outside the norm here is that worries me if I'm, I'm guessing DD3 is coming – and I'm thinking it's going to be born again. And Ben Yurick was huge inside of that storyline. But I could see where maybe Karen is going to take on that mantle. I don't know. But, you know, I've, I mean, Karen's um, feeding of information and then this low-tech version of uh, Flowers in the Window leads me to like, wow, it's interesting that Frank knows this kind of trade craft because especially going into like episode two where micro is now and giving us a moment of levity, which I think is well deserved because, you know, reading some online comments like, oh, this is uh, it's, it's just it's hard to watch, uh, you know, kind of this is just so depressing in some capacity. It's like, yeah, but there's there are these moments of light, especially when the waitress 
um, calls Frank a hipster, and so yes. does Karen. Which that whole that whole element of cat and mouse like spy game is just it it, it really moves a needle that I really enjoy. That really sold me on John Bernthal as trying to be as three dimensional a Frank as he can be. Yep. I mean, granted, you know, Frank is designed to be as close to one or two dimensional as possible. But that just that moment where she just looks at him and says, you know, we don't get many hipsters around here. And he just comes right back with you. Still don't, lady. <laughs> and, and then and then you get the hipster. It's for you line. It was like, OK, and maybe I can, I can rock I can a man along bun? with this. Yes, right. I those I did not expect to find myself really like breaking out in spontaneous laughter in this series because it's the Punisher. Moments of levity like that are really not supposed to be in a Frank story unless it's something really snarky or really, you know, off putting. But just the natural way that that kind of bounced around, I I really liked it. And I was really hoping there would be more of that in the series going forward. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, he's, he's a dark character. It's a dark world, but they are putting in enough to, you know, keep it a little from being too depressing or too dark, too over the top. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I, I just couldn't. After seeing at least, I think I was at, at that point, I was on like six episodes, and I saw some of those tweets, and I was just like, "Are, are you watching it? Because I'm not seeing what you're seeing." I mean, I granted it's, it's heavy, um, but. You know, and I'll, I'll point out the beginning of episode two. It really spoke to me. Um, number one, the interstitial music with the guitar and piano drops is really nice. But having that flashback scene with Frank and his kids uh, on the ferry, there's a moment of touching with just he's with his kids. You know that he's lost them. And then there's that moment where... You know, he's obviously, you know, been in the field and he's come back in from country and his son says, oh, you're going out to, to kill some Hajis and Frank snaps. And it's, yeah, I, I, you know, it was, it's a great building moment, not only, and whether you're a Democrat, Republican, I don't really care. I frankly, I just don't give a shit. And this is why I go ahead and check the box right now. Um, that, and it, besides that, this is TVMA. So, you know, the babies out there shouldn't be listening anyway. Um, the lens kids go to bed. That's right. They're out. But th I thought that was a, a good moment of teaching that that's not a great word to use. It's real. And Frank is teaching that. And it, did he teach it right? I don't know, but I'll guarantee the kid doesn't say it again. And maybe he learned something. But that whole scene really brought forward like where Frank is. Again, that three-dimensional this you were bringing up that, you know, he's 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 a human being and he's got the this, his character is rich. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and from my perspective, being a if I'd watched this movie 10 years or watched the series 10 years ago, I wouldn't it wouldn't have hit me as much as it does now. But I have a six and a half year old son. And the other day I was having a conversation with him and it wasn't anything to that extent, but he was trying to explain to me something and his his mom cut him off saying, you know, we don't talk about stuff like that. And I was trying to balance out whether I should let him go or whether I should stop him. And this was before I had watched this episode. And just as a parent, understanding that you want your kid, obviously you want you to raise your kids the right way. But they're going to subconsciously and just by matter of osmosis pick up these things. And when they start sending them back to you, there is that initial flash where you get really mad. But then you stop and take a breath and go, what am I getting mad for? Why did this moment happen? And when Frank turns around and looks at his son and kisses him on the forehead and basically says, you know, my bad. And, and he that was a teaching moment for Frank that – he understood that even though his son did something he didn't like, he's got to know how to – you can't be the punisher here. And you can't be a punisher as a parent here in terms of just saying, well, you're wrong. You're bad. Go to your room. you got to be better about it. You have to be smarter about it. 
And, and I think that's why it, it was important that they showed him watching that scene because it was, you know, himself looking back and they actually, you know, it wasn't like third, you know, it wasn't like outside. He was actually sitting there and, you know, physically seeing it. And I think that was a, a, a nice. Yeah, that was particularly poignant to me because I was that kid. My dad was a Vietnam vet. And uh, I had my fair share of those sorts of encounters. And uh, it's, I mean, it's just another instance of taking it one step too far and then regretting it. Let me let me move the puck a little bit further. Um, we get a little bit more of Micro. In fact, we learn that he is David Lieberman because that's where Karen's story uh, kind of keeps going and Karen gives him the information he needs. And what does Frank do? Again, he uses tradecraft to go ahead and uh, socially engineer a little um, little accident with uh, Sarah, Micro's wife. Yeah, that was kind of creepy to me when uh, Castle was in uh, in Sarah's house. I did give him points for taking a page out of the WWE Art of War special because he used the razor blade to cut his forehead after he got hit by the van. Yes. It was one of those where I had to go back and watch it. And I was like, what is, why are we, sh- oh, oh, and when she goes, you're, you're bleeding. I was like, oh, Ric Flair would be so proud. Absolutely. Well, and then we, and to find out then that, you know, this idea that I found very interesting, which is, well, first of all, she invites him in, he cleans himself up. And Micro has been basically surveilling the entire house for – well, how long has Micro been, quote, dead? Okay. But how would that look – how would that feel to be that close to your family and at the same time they think you're dead? I mean, the, I mean you can kind of see where Lieberman is – he's kind of losing it slightly and he's, and he's scrambling for – this one thing that he needs, which is Frank, his Frank becomes the arm and he is the brain. It definitely puts him in a situation of desperation, right? I mean, he's he's desperate to get back and that, that just drives him forward. I mean, it's kind of like, like self-torture for him. Like he, he's watching his family and he can't interact with them. He can't tell them he's alive. Whereas Frank is more like the unconscious torture, but he's re- reliving his family's death over and over again. I also kind of find it Interesting, because my take on it is Lieberman had resigned himself to basically being a ghost. And when he you know, sees Frank, he sees an opportunity, you know, which I don't think he thought he'd have. And he's kind of desperate about it. Yeah, it brings up this whole I- – this other little thread that – especially in these first three episodes comes up in this thing called the second life. Uh, Curtis talks about it and Russo talks about it. Um, and actually I think it was in the same conversation, but, um, and we probably need to talk about Russo at some point, because if you've looked at anything online, uh, he's not listed necessarily as Bill Russo, but as Jigsaw. And I'm not going to go any further with that because we haven't seen that and it's not part of this this particular collective. But this idea of the second life of what are you going to be after everything's fallen apart or after this uh, – after you're out of the garbage, what what are you going to do with yourself? Yeah, and, and Billy, especially with his whole ability to create Anvil and now he's running, I guess, kind of a quasi-paramilitary group – private contracting and he's the one that that has that ability to really capitalize on what he was able to do overseas with frank and in that unit um to the the most economic benefit um and the fact that we see him later on in in episode three going back to curtis and having that scene where he hands curtis the check that funds the group i thought that was an interesting point as well where you know, you you have somebody who is a benefactor who is trying to empathize with the people who are not as fortunate as he is to come back in that situation. Uh, as a point of, of Syracusean reference, if I may, it was worth pointing out that Ben Barnes, who plays Billy Russo, 
was the younger version version of Dustin Thorne in the movie Stardust, which starred Charlie Cox as Dustin's son, Tristan. <laughs> so there's multiple degrees of connectivity between a couple of different shows and and uh, things that they were doing before they entered the M- uh, MTU. Huh. That's and that's also Henry... Because- and also Henry Cavill had a had a cameo in uh, Stardust as well. He played one of the minions. So Superman was in that movie as well. I will say I saw the first episode of The Punisher directly after Justice League. Ooh. Well, see, I was just happy that, that they were releasing Punisher to counteract any of the DC uh, bad stuff. Well, and, and I'll jump in there and mention, jump back to Madani for a second. I kept thinking every time I saw her mom in a scene that I was watching The Expanse. So it kind of circles around. Yeah, you know, that actress has gotten a lot of work based around, I think, mostly her beauty and her voice. I mean, they're both extremely unique. And I think that relationship, you know, is one that we'll probably need to talk about at some point here. I think it gets explored a little bit further later. But, um, you know, the idea of... She needs – in fact, I believe her mother says uh, you need to learn to trust people because Madani's ready to, to do a one-woman or one-person, however you want to say it again. <laughs> um, but th- this idea of she's going to take on everybody rather than getting even her partner on board on what she wants to do. Like you, you need to be able to trust somebody, and obviously that ends up turning into Frank. I will say just in general, the minute they started talking about a conspiracy in Kandahar, uh, I started watching very carefully for a Mark Spector reference. All right. Un- unpack that a little bit because I'm not sure I know what that is. Moon Mark Knight? Spector is Moon Knight. Oh, geez. Not that. Also known as Batman. <laughs> gotcha. All right. They've been talking about doing a Netflix Moon Knight show for a while now. That's interesting. Now, there's what were I, I was there were a few things that like I was kind of hoping maybe you guys could unpack a little bit for me because we talk about Operation Cerebus, which is mm-hmm. Schoonover and Agent Orange. They also talk about, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's Russo. He says something about the Phoenix program. Does that ring anybody's bell? Phoenix program would most likely have been a reference to stuff uh, clandestine operations in Vietnam. If I remember right, there were mentions of that, or at least that was a, a prominent term that was used in a lot of uh, 1980s post-Vietnam uh, movies and things like that that I was uh, watched as a kid. Uh, I would have to go back and do more research on it, but my logical guess would be that it's he's just looking at it from a historical perspective. Okay. Because I, I hadn't seen a whole lot of like little tiny threads going to other MCU or MTU stuff, and I was like, "Right, this isn't something that I'm familiar with." And I was like, eh, "Is it or isn't it, or is it real?" But that also yeah. plays into um, Paul Schultz's character Rollins. His classification is Agent Orange. Right. Gotcha. So perfect. Um, so. It's certainly not a reference to Jean Grey Phoenix because, you know, that's Fox and – That's what I figured, but I was like, eh. But just just point of fact, Operation Phoenix was the CIA operation in Vietnam that targeted key figures in uh, the Vietnamese power structure. OK, yeah, that makes more sense because I was thinking maybe it might have somehow tie back to Jessica Jones with like the nuke, like his drugs he was taking and that kind of program. But that makes more sense. So it's another reference to torture and killings, targeted killings. Yeah, Yeah, basically, it's the quintessential CIA goes out and kills people program. Um, Something I kind of like about the nuke thing is it all goes back to the super soldier project. They just keep trying over and over and over again, and that's kind of the, uh, the guiding principle of... A lot of the MCU stuff, even new kind of did his hair and styled himself after Steve Rogers. Right, but I do like about the distinction between that part of Daredevil and uh, and Jessica Jones and Punisher is that there is no aspersion to anything to do with super soldiers. or anything. These are just grunts. Yeah. These are grunts going in, tasked to do a job. There's no superpowers. There's no flash and bang. It's just you have equipment. And as Agent Orange says, I point, you shoot. 
Boy, that was a, that was the, yeah, that was a powerful moment. Like, of look, this is what we're doing, guys, and and then, but then having the 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 after conversation of like, we don't even know who this guy is. Some of the guys are calling him Agent Orange. Uh, we're also introduced, uh, by the way, to Gunnar Henderson, which ends up being a very interesting character later on, um, and very crucial to the plot line, but. We're not we're not fully aware of how that all works just yet, um, but especially after Kandahar, and well, we see that's where uh, Agent Orange uh, Rollins gets his milky eye because Frank uh, absolutely destroys him because Frank says we're going into an absolute ambush. This is a no win situation. You cannot do it. And again, it's told this is what we're doing, and you'll do it. And, right. It's 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 the bureaucratic zealotry of Rollins versus Frank's gut. And of course, Frank ends up being the one who's right. And we see the scene where uh, Schoonauer loses his arm. Oh, that's right. Yes, that that pays that that pays that off from from uh, season two of Daredevil. Right. Because at first I thought he was leading him into a trap to like trim off some of the guys that were maybe getting too close to what was really going on. Mm-hmm. But then with Schoonauer losing his arm, I thought, OK, well, maybe it wasn't a trap on the CIA side, but. Yeah, so there's a lot of like try to guess who's who's wrong, who's right, what's going on, you know, who's set people up. And again, that uh, you know, I, I I talk about when I used to teach. I talk about kind of consequences. You know, when 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 you when you have an action, you have a consequence, and and that's how you learn. Um, but it, what I found, you know, kind of beneficial in that whole, it could have been Frank on a total blood spree. Uh, with you know in inside inside that village and but the consequence was we had well we had schoonover lose his arm but there were there was a a, an impact to all this it wasn't your lethal weapon uh 400 guys are dead and the hero emerges there was a tremendous cost and again kudos to barenthal or the writers whoever that understood the cortisol after being inside a, a hot zone like that, that he's got, they all had the shakes, something severe, like once they got back um, on base. I, w- I was flabbergasted by that. And Agent Orange's response of just, did you kill him, was perfect because it's totally set up the, the, the right chain of reinteractions. Yeah. Yeah, if there is... a. Again, this is a it's a small gripe on my part, but it, it and I suppose it goes to the the nature of casting in Hollywood or in in most shows nowadays. But the guy that plays Rollins, Paul Scholes, was the missionary in the last Rambo film, so it was interesting seeing him as a complete and utter pacifist in that film, or in, and then transition into a warmongering bureaucrat in The Punisher with a milky eye, um, and that also plays into. Uh, the scene that we get after this with Lewis's PTSD episode in his basement where he almost shoots his dad, which I thought was a really powerful scene as well. But the fact that his dad is played by Tim Guinea, who is Major Allen in Iron Man 1 and Iron Man 2, it took me a second where I was like, wait a minute, is that is he the same guy and that's his kid? Or it was there, there are so many different, because I've seen so, these actors in so many different roles nowadays, it, it was one of those where I was like, are you sure, you're really sure you couldn't have found somebody a little bit different to, to put in these roles? That's not to say they're bad, but it was one of those where having to, to kind of pull myself back from what I know about them, from what I've seen in other uh, other media, it was a little bit disconcerting because it, it kind of took me out of what I wanted to get out of The Punisher. But again, small gripe. Uh, speaking of Lewis, because I, I, I've been wanting to talk about this as well, there is another member of the group um, – and I kind of want to touch on this and then obviously a little bit about uh, Frank's interrogation of Micro. Um, but there's another gentleman in the group, and he plays kind of the hard right um, straight edge of NRA, um, flag-coded, and almost to the point of conspiracy, but he seems to be an, – and he's the – He's the hard Republican uh, conspiracy nut inside of the, this group. Um, and I, I cannot remember this guy's name to save my life. O'Connor. There O'Connor. he is, O'Connor. 
Um, I found having him in the mix was not, he wasn't made fun of for being what he's like and the views that he holds, which whether you agree with him or not, it's still a view, but it wasn't, um, I shouldn't say, uh, it was it, it didn't become a thing of humor. It, he was, this is another type of person that is inside of this kind of group. Well, and it's also his coping mechanism, right? I mean, that's how he's handling everything is to make it a conspiracy and make it a, a thing to be confronted. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it would have been inappropriate extremely to, in the context of a support group, you know, mock him or criticize him for whatever views he has. Um, it just, I, Again, I think it's just showing another broken person broken in a different way. Well, and I, I mean, some of the members do kind of comment on it and call him out anytime he starts to speak. But, you know, Curtis does a really good job of, of you know, keeping that under control and, and letting him have his way because, like, it is his, his mechanism of, of handling that trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, O'Connor to me seemed like a superfluous caricature that didn't really need to be there. I mean, uh, granted, everybody has some connection to somebody who has that similar viewpoint or I mean it doesn't take much to find people who who fit that mold in in current discourse but to me it was if they had just focused it more on what was happening with Lewis and and what he was going through and how he gets kind of to where he's starting now and to kind of see where he may end up as as the series goes along I found that a lot more interesting for me than to have, well, let's throw in a guy who's downtrodden and bitter and he's got an NRA hat and everything's a conspiracy and it's all about revolution and all that stuff. I was like, if if they had taken O'Connor out, I wouldn't have missed his lack, his absence one bit. I, re I really wouldn't have. Yeah, because I'm trying to figure out if that's, and I've only seen the first three, so you, you, the other guys might know better, but... I'm trying to figure out if that's because he, he gave Lewis this pamphlet at mm -hmm. the end of somewhere if that's like lead, leading to like some like right wing militia group or something in the future episodes. I wasn't sure. You took the words right out of my mouth because that's exactly what I was about to bring up was that pamphlet. And again, I've only seen the first three also. So. Yeah. Uh, without saying too much, I will say that having O'Connor there adds a a piece to Lewis's puzzle, and it's something we'll have to look forward to. Uh, and I don't want to say much more than that because I think some people might say, oh, I saw this from a mile away. Bullshit. You didn't. I'm going to say that right out because I don't think you, I don't think you did, but you might have. Yeah, but I, I thought also, they handled that scene of, of Lewis when when he had the breakdown in his basement. I thought they handled that really, really well. And not just from the standpoint of of how Daniel Weber, who plays Lewis, how he acted that scene out, but just the. The way that his dad, you know, he's standing there and obviously they're both freaked out of their minds, but it's just, OK, you need you need to have contact. You need to have somebody who is there to make sure that you're OK. You're my son. You're OK. Mm -hmm. And the fact that Lewis gets up and leaves because he can't emotionally process what just happened because his mind is so, so twisted by what he had gone through Um to have to to go back to the group and deal with O'Connor, I I that just it it took me out of it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I you know it's one of those it's one of those side thread storylines that I I think they had to tread very carefully, and I think for the most part I think they did. I'll be curious as we go forward how that how that how that 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 thread gets pulled and and your yeah. reactions to it. I think it's actually a good thing they included him it's, uh, because it's a bit of verisimilitude that is a influencing force on a lot of people today. Yes, absolutely. And, and it's, I mean, it, it, I mean, it read a little true to me that if you're going to have however many veterans there, at least one of them, is you know gonna? I mean, in every era, like the conspiracy uh, 
uh, theorist veteran is a trope. It's just this is how it takes shape in this era. Uh, so let me – I'm going to round this out because I think we're about to – near near the, the near the end of the line for you know episode three um we do have frank who basically uses again more tradecraft to penetrating into uh microchip's den and then microchip being stripped down and taken out of quote his routine and it's not about pain it's about time and frank uh, uses that time to grill into him and find out a little bit more about him. How? What? what, what what's our feelings on on that whole uh, escapade? I, I love that whole the whole sequence. I mean, it was like I guess at the end you kind of learned that Micro was kind of playing Frank too, and Frank was trying to play him. It was. I mean, the, the scenes with them together talking about you know, how you know the pain's not what gets you; it's it's time, and just the scenes of them together talking, you can really just see. Like you know what Frank's gone through, what what Micro's gone through, and they're they're trying to, you know, get you know out of each other what they want, and it, it was pretty good. I liked it. I, I did I like the like, fact that. Uh, oh, go ahead. I said I liked it a lot because it would have been really disingenuous if these two people met on the phone and like, oh hey, let's be besties, you know, <laughs> because uh, getting them to work together, to trust each other, to not kill each other on site is actually a pretty big deal if you if you think where they both came from. And I think that the micro being capable of getting out of that situation is going to lead to uh, I don't know about friendship, but a respect from Frank that that's going to be required for them to be able to work together. If he'd have just you know suffered through it, I don't know that it would have ended up with the same relationship. Yeah, I did like the the uses of tradecraft by both sides. I mean, especially when you think about how Micro got connected to Frank in the first place in episode two, where he sends him on that goose chase up to the roof, and then you look back at the diner, and Micro's been standing there the whole time. I looked at it, I was like, ooh, that was slick. You're right. And then, and the fact that Frank turns the tables on him and basically goes, okay, I've seen what you can do in your tradecraft. Now you're going to see mine, and you're really not going to like it. But the fact that Micro kept trying to get him to flinch basically saying when at the start of episode three of you know this whole place is wired so if you don't get me over there in before that timer runs out we're all gonna die and what does frank do he sits down on his chair yes. with his can of beans and just basically goes i'll wait you out and he finally gets the point and then later on when he's had a chance to kind of soften micro up he comes back and says i've checked this whole place and there are no bombs so we're going to keep doing this until you're straight with me. And Micro starts to understand that he's now – Frank is now in his machine mode, and that machine is not going to stop until he gets what he wants. And Micro, using the cleverness enough to go with the old Cold War tactic of the needle in the pen <laughs> to jam him in the arm, I was like, okay. I wasn't quite sure how he thought to have that there considering – all the surveillance he had and everything to think, okay, if, if push comes to shove, I will be in a situation where I need a needle and a pen. But I was, I went along with it because I was just like, okay, good, good way to turn the tables back in your control. The, the setup for that was weird. I like, I kept watching him the way he was using the keyboard and putting that pen in play. And I was like, this is so weird. Why is that bothering me so bad? It's like, because, because I know you're not able to type real well. But it, that the setup, uh, I think 90% paid off because it's like we had no idea what was in that pen and we thought it was just a pen. But like the setup that he did that, you know, two times and it was like, why, why is he holding this pen? Yeah, I guess it goes back to that the whole like, you know, it's all the routine that Frank kept talking about. Like, you know, you get used to the routine and then when he disrupt the routine, you know, so he just kept using the pen like this is just what I do. And then, you know. Well, if you think about it, Micro has been pursued slash – marked for death by the spooks and it stands to reason that at some point some somebody who's intending to kill him afterwards will be forcing him to use his computer that's a pretty foreseeable situation for someone in micros yeah, uh, yeah, so, yeah so it made perfect sense to me that he'd have something innocuous there that he could turn 
But but Mike right. Rose, no pushover. That's I think that's the I think that's an interesting the counterbalance of the two. It's like, yes, we are we are not cut of the same cloth, but if you mess with me, I can mess just directly to you. But like, especially Barenthal with the knife play, opening that can of beans, like there was something like I, I, I hesitate saying this, but like that element of the, his method acting there brought the brought this weird realism that you are comfortable holding a knife because I can't just take a K bar and just blast through a tin can like that, nor eat off of it the way he did. <laughs> it and I love the fact that, me, that Micro looks at him and just uh, says, you know, you, you're going to get dysentery that way. <laughs> <laughs> It reminded me of nothing so much as Rorschach from The Watchmen and his bean-eating scene. Ah. Right, but at the same time, when you jump ahead to the end of the episode and Micro has turned the tables completely on Frank, and then what does he do? He gives Frank a cup of tea and basically says, okay, let's have this out. And the line that I took out of that was, every missile needs a guidance system. Yes. And right. Frank scoffs at it. Yes. But when Micro hammers it home to him and says, look, Here's the deal. You need me. I need you to achieve the same goal. You want to get the people who killed your family. I want the people who took me away from mine. We can either sit here and have this dick measuring contest for the next 11 episodes, or we can get this done. And the fact that Frank looks at him and finally agrees, but only under the conditions of no trials, no bullshit, they die. And that you get that pause where, Micro processes that, and then his last line is, "Yeah, I can live with that." And and I think, I think that sets this micro uh, up to be a better character than the microchip I remember from the comics because it's a much more, you know, even relationship as opposed. To, I remember that one just being kind of a uh, assistant or sidekick type role. Very much so. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of remember microchip being you know number number one everybody seemed to have this big beef like oh well he's not this pudgy you know doughy guy i was like that's okay this guy is i'm the the actor is absolutely stellarific in my my accounting of the of a guy that i could see working behind the scenes working maybe sleeping two hours a day but constantly and let me let me just put this out there this gate analysis for him to see where Frank is, that was that was kind of a, a it was a great little uh, genius move. I, I was like, I, I don't know how that works, but I enjoy it. Yeah, as until this portrayal, I've always viewed uh, Microchip as a cut rate whistler from Blade, <laughs> but uh, definitely brought a lot more interesting depth to this character. Yeah, and the fact that they didn't play him to the full archetype of him being some morbidly obese guy who hates sunlight and, and is almost like Caliban and Logan where he just he goes outside and you think he's just going to spontaneously combust. And what was interesting to me, especially when you go back to see the scenes when Frank was in the house with his wife and you see the emotional toll that's taking on him where he's sitting there and he wants to do something, but he's he is trying to figure out what to do. But knowing that he's looking through a screen and that is his world, his sphere ends at the ends of those computer monitors. And sometimes that causes him to act rashly and incorrectly when he can have more time when he's calm like he was at the end with Frank and just let himself process things out. But he was forward thinking enough, even though even though those scenes to to not rush in and, and blow his cover and, and let everybody know he was alive. You know, he, he held off, even though he was obviously in emotional distress. So. Well, and to find out that the bomb is really information, it's that all these video feeds go live, not and it's not so much to blow out, hopefully, the person that killed him, but to let his family know is like a final thing. A final act that I'm a, I'm still alive. I'm not who they said I was. That's his kaboom. Yeah, it's like they're they're the two halves of the same coin. Yes. Like, you know, Frank tried to shoot his way through and, and take care of his problems, you know, the brute force way. That didn't quite work. Micro tried to gather information and release the information to handle his problem. That didn't quite work. So they they both need each other to, you know, ultimately solve both their goals. 
And I kind of like the every missile needs a guidance system line because it sounded like a slightly more equitable version of I point you shoot. Ah, interesting. Yeah, so now you have three different characters now because you have Madonna, you have Frank, and you have uh, Micro who are all trying to achieve the same goal, but they're going at it in three different directions. But you can see at some point later on the series, that's going to have to come to a Mm -hmm. point Mm -hmm. in order to achieve what they ultimately want. So it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. Well, from the minute they introduced uh, Mahadi, I I was figuring they either have to team up or kill each other. Right, but you can't have Frank killing a woman. That's just not going to happen. We know that. Right? My my one of my theories as of episode two was it was going to go the other way. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. When when she when when she learns Frank was the one that shot her partner, maybe we'll see what happens then. But very interesting. It would be very similar to uh, maybe Billy Russo finding out that every that Curtis knew that Frank was still alive. Well, gents. Uh, speaking of team ups, this has been a team up. Uh, that I wasn't expecting and I thoroughly enjoyed and I thank you for. So let me just thank Devin, Eric, Jason, and Sean for coming by over to the War Journal and writing in your particular entry into the journal. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yes, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Yes, been a blast. Until next time, I'll see you on the War Journal. I guarantee you'll meet up with the suicide bomb at hell.